AZ Republican Party. So I'm not sure if you want to take that live or not. All right, we're going to take that live, Danielle. Thanks again for calling in. You're welcome. Fox 10's Danielle Miller live on the phone. Let's go ahead and listen into the event now. Before Governor Pence speaks, I have the great honor to introduce to you somebody who's leading our state in a meaningful way. Look, Arizona has become ground zero for this campaign. A lot of the policy discussions, people are looking at our state for education funding, the civics bill that has been passed where we actually have to have people that understand civics in order to progress and get out of high school. He's been leading us. As far as jobs and economic growth, every time I call, they say, hey, Governor Ducey's in this state or this country or doing this, and he's recruiting people back here as far as corporations to put us to work to make sure Arizona's story is heard by everybody. So I want to welcome the greatest governor, our Governor Doug Ducey. How about Chairman Robert Graham? Has he done a great job? I want to thank you for the warm welcome, and I want to tell you how excited I am to be at the Mesa Convention Center to introduce the next Vice President of the United States, Indiana Governor Mike Pence. Next Tuesday, we get to decide which way America and Arizona will go. And I'll tell you the direction I want to head. It's the way that conservative governors like Mike Pence are leading. Much like the man that Mike Pence will serve as Vice President, he is a man of action. As Governor of Indiana, he did something that Washington politicians cannot do. He made government live within its means. He balanced the budget. He lowered taxes. And Mike knows that government does not create jobs. So he got out of the way and let the free market thrive. In Congress, Mike was a strong advocate for the value of all life. for our God-given right to keep and bear arms. For our security, our military, our law enforcement, and our veterans. And without question, in a Trump-Pence administration, our men and women in uniform will respect the honor and care they have earned. <laughs> Mike's past is a proven indicator of what's to come. As a governor, Mike knows full well that Washington, D.C. does far too much and is good at very little. He recognizes the ingenuity of our states and our local leaders, and he will stand shoulder to shoulder with Donald Trump to ensure that our voices are heard. <laughs> Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton would only continue to grow 
the federal government by appointing agency heads handpicked by Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and Supreme Court justices who share her failed liberal ideas. It's time for a change. It's time for new leadership in Washington, D.C. But it won't happen unless you act. Whether you drop off your mail-in ballot or vote at the polls, I'm asking you to cast your ballot for Donald Trump, for Mike Pence, and for Republicans across the board, including the Corporation Commission, Joe Arpaio, and vote no on Prop 205. Together, we can win. We can win next Tuesday and start making America great again. Now I want you to give it up and give a warm Arizona welcome to my good friend, the great governor of the state of Indiana and the next vice president of the United States, Mike Pence. I'm Mike Pence. I'm from Indiana. And a little more than three months ago, it was my great privilege with my family at my side to accept my party's nomination to run and serve as the next Vice President of the United States of America. And I'm so honored. I'm so honored to be with all of you today. So honored to be with you today. Six days away from a great victory all across the state of Arizona and all across the United States of America. And I'm so honored, I'm so honored to be introduced before you today by one of the great governors in the United States of America, Doug Ducey, a businessman who went to a chief executive office just like we're going to do in Washington, D.C. in six days. Doug and I are great friends. We really are. Fellow governors, and I admire him so much, but he, he knows me well enough to know that the introduction I prefer is a little bit shorter than that one. <laughs> I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican. And that is. And I have to tell you, I joined this campaign in a heartbeat because you have nominated a man for president who never quits who never backs down. He is a fighter. He is a winner. And until very recently, it seemed like he was out there fighting all on his own. But now this movement is coming together. This party is coming together. Arizona is coming together. We're going to make Donald Trump the next president of the United States of America. You know, people ask me all the time, what is it about Donald Trump? I tell him, Donald Trump just gets it. You with me on that? I mean, I think Donald Trump literally embodies the spirit of America. Strong, freedom-loving, independent, optimistic, and willing to fight every single day for what he believes in and for what will make America great again. All right? I mean, the truth of the matter is, you saw that. You saw that fight in those debates, didn't you? When a week and a half ago, he beat Hillary Clinton in that last debate, hands down. 
We had a we got our turn at debating. We had a little vice presidential debate over in Farmville, Virginia, not too long ago. You know, I want to, you know, I, I want to apologize for being a few minutes late because I, I stopped for brunch and uh, I stopped for brunch and, and uh, Senator Tim Kaine called and interrupted me ten times. So. <laughs> You know, so, some people think that we won that debate in Farmville, Virginia, and I'm uh, very humbled by that. But let me tell you, from where I was sitting, Donald Trump won that debate. Yeah. Donald Trump's brand of leadership won that debate, and Donald Trump's vision to make America great again is going to win all the way to the White House. You know, and you know, it's not like it's exactly been a fair fight out there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, ever since I joined this ticket, I mean, I, I get up every morning, I got to turn on the television with a stick. <laughs> you with me on that? <laughs> I, I never know what's going to be on there. You know, what I mean, it's like like the media is out there. You know, it's like two on one every day with the media doing half of Hillary Clinton's work for. Her. But the amazing thing is Donald Trump is still winning hearts and minds every day. And he's going to win all the way to the White House. You know, it's, it was kind of funny to watch the media, though. Remember about a week ago, the media, Hillary Clinton and her allies were trying to, trying to say this campaign was all but over. You know, it's like they were measuring the curtains in the Oval Office. Isn't that right, Trent? I mean, <laughs> It's like making cabinet appointment announcements and this and that. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, Arizona was never confused. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. This race is on. We are six points ahead in early ballot returns. It's all knotted up and we're leading in national polls. Let me tell you something. We know a little bit something about racing in Indianapolis. So I'll tell you where this stands. It is wheel to wheel. We are coming out of the fourth turn. It is hammer down. And Donald Trump and I are going to sprint to the checkered flag here in Arizona and beyond. You know, Hillary Clinton may have the media, the money, and the special interests on her side, but Donald Trump and I got something a little more powerful. We got a basket of Americans that are saying enough is enough. <laughs> and we're going to make America great again. You know, the truth is that people all across Arizona and all across this country are coming to conclude that this election is not so much just a choice between two people. It's a choice between two futures. So let me tell you where I stand. I choose a stronger America. I choose a more prosperous America. I choose an America that upholds our highest constitutional principles. So I choose to stand with Donald Trump and every American who knows we can make America great again. You know, I heard that Hillary Clinton's going to be in Arizona a little bit later today. Gonna be in Tempe. So let me just let me tell you though. I mean, she, 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 she's gonna be up in Tempe giving a speech. I'm sure she'll show up with that campaign of insults against my running mate that they've been running from the get-go. But if you if you take time to watch her speech, there's a few things you might look for. Okay. I'm just saying. Here in, uh, here in Arizona, you might, you, might, you might look for, you know, whether or not, I mean, will, will she mention her call for open borders like she did when she gave that speech in Brazil? <laughs> I'm just wondering her speech here in Arizona, will, will she mention her support for Obamacare now that average premiums are going to go up 116%? And, uh, you know, with her newfound calls for transparency, 
Will she finally release the 33,000 emails she refused to turn over to the FBI? You know, the truth of the matter is the American people, the American people are getting tired of the fast and loose ethics of the Clintons. And it sounds like the Department of Justice is starting to feel that way too. You know, it's a very serious thing. After concluding last summer that Hillary Clinton had classified documents on a private server, that she was just extremely careless with handling those, those documents, they concluded their investigation. But you all heard about it last Friday. The director of the FBI sent a letter to the Congress informing them they'd learned of the existence of emails pertinent to the investigation, and the FBI has reopened the investigation into Hillary Clinton's classified handling of classified documents on her server. It's a serious matter. It's a serious matter. And look, we commend the FBI for reopening the case, following the facts, because here in America, no one is above the law. We're confident the FBI handled this investigation in a professional and a timely way, but as facts come to light in the days ahead, let's, let's talk about what we already know, okay? I mean, because there's literally been an avalanche of information that's come out. You know, I like to say truth is a force of nature. And the truth has been coming out about, about Hillary Clinton's years. And here's the thing, it, it, that, that while she was Secretary of State in charge of all the foreign policy of the United States of America, her family operated a private family foundation that accepted money from foreign governments and foreign donors. And then, she had, and then she had in between those two things what was found out by the media to be a private server, presumably to keep communications about what was going out, out of the public reach. I mean, it really is extraordinary. But let's talk about what we already know. I mean, we found out that at least a dozen companies that gave money to the Clinton Foundation also lobbied the State Department at the same time and they used lobbyists who were raising money for her presidential campaign to do it. I mean, we found out that from the FBI that officials at her State Department actually offered the FBI a quid pro quo if she'd let them change the classified status on emails that made their way onto her private server. We found out that even though she said it never, she said it never happened, that, that aides of Hillary Clinton at the State Department actually said that friends of the Clintons should be flagged for business in rebuilding Haiti after that terrible earthquake back in 2010 and everybody else would be just sent to the website, right? And lastly, we, we learned in the newspapers about what the media even called a circle of enrichment around the Clintons where, where literally the major corporations had contribute large donations to the Clinton Foundation, then those same corporations would be approached for personal income contracts for former President Clinton, $66 million over a nine-year period of time. You know, let me just say something. If only for their decades of self-dealing, conflicts of interest, the politics of personal enrichment, and outright corruption, Arizona, we must ensure that Hillary Clinton is never elected president of the United States of America. You know, the American people are sick and tired of pay-to-play politics benefiting the favored few. And that's exactly the kind of politics that's going to come to a crashing halt the day that Donald Trump becomes president of the United States. Because I've got to tell you, Donald Trump's got a plan. We're going to work with a newly reelected Congress. And in the first 100 days, we're going to reform the ethics laws in Washington, D.C. We're going to change the direction. We're going to have government as good as our people. We're going to drain the swamp. But the truth is, the truth is, for, uh, for all the roiling scandals around the Clintons that, 
continue to come out virtually by the day. The truth is, you in Arizona know this election is about a lot bigger things than their small ethics, and so we need to talk about that. I truly do believe this, this election is about our security. It's about our prosperity. And it's about the destiny of the Supreme Court of the United States of America. And we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it. On security, despite traveling millions of miles as our Secretary of State, it's undeniable. The world is more dangerous today than the day that Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama took over managing America's place on the world stage. Seven and a half years of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama's form of foreign policy is weakened America's place in the world. Our allies are less secure. Our enemies are more emboldened. I mean, you look at wider areas of the Middle East today and compare them to what it looked like in January of 2009. It doesn't even look like the same part of the world. You know, history teaches us that weakness arouses evil. And I would submit to you that the weak and feckless foreign policy of this administration, the architect of which was Hillary Clinton, of leading from behind, of moving red lines, of feigning resets with Russia and paying ransom to terrorist sponsoring states is emblematic of a failed foreign policy. Hey, let me make you a promise. When Donald Trump becomes president of the United States, we won't be paying ransom to terrorist sponsoring states. They'll be paying a price. I mean, it was Hillary Clinton who actually initiated that disastrous agreement with the radical mullahs in Iran. They got $1.7 billion in cash, $150 billion. And all we got was a promise of a delay in the nuclear ambitions of the leading state sponsor of terrorism in the world. And remember this, it was Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State who failed to renegotiate a status of forces agreement with the sovereign government of Iraq. I mean, it's important to remember, men and women, that through great hardship and extraordinary sacrifice, by the end of 2008, the American soldier won the peace and won security in Operation Iraqi Freedom. They got the job done. In fact, before I go one step further, I'm, I'm positive there are men and women who wore the uniform in that conflict and in other conflicts throughout our history who are with us today. If you're able to stand, or if you could just raise your hand, would you just give us a chance? Stand up, raise your hand if we can thank you for serving this country. Thank you for your service from the bottom of our hearts. But it was, it was Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama who made the decision to pull all American forces out of Iraq by the end of 2012 and literally created a vacuum in which the monstrous terrorist organization ISIS was able to be conjured up out of the desert to overrun vast areas that the American soldier had already won, had already won in Iraq. I mean, today as we stand here, there's more than 5,000 special forces back in harm's way in Iraq. They're in our hearts. They're in our prayers. We think of them today. But they're there because of the failed policy and failed judgment of this president and his secretary of state. And lastly, it was Hillary Clinton. It was Hillary Clinton who left Americans in harm's way in Benghazi. And after four Americans fell, she told the families of the fallen, she told the families of the fallen as their caskets were quietly carried off the aircraft at Dover Air Force Base that it was because of a filmmaker here in the States, even though she had emailed her daughter on the night of the attack that it was a terrorist-style Al-Qaeda attack. It's important to remember, because I've, I've talked to some veterans of that battle, just in the last week, as I've traveled this country, you heard that movie entitled 13 Hours. It's a, it's a strong film. People that were there say it's an accurate depiction. 
But you might have the wrong impression from the title of the film, like, like we sent help in 13 hours. Truth of the matter is, Hillary Clinton's State Department never sent help. Never did. Soldiers were never wheels up to go render aid to those that were in harm's way. And after it was found out, the conflicts between what had really happened and what Hillary Clinton and the administration had said happened for days after the attack, she sat before the Senate when confronted about it, and she spoke words I'll never forget. She said, quote, of those four fallen Americans, quote, what difference at this point does it make? Well, let me tell you, as the proud father of a United States Marine, anybody who said that, anybody who said that, anybody who did that should be disqualified from ever serving as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States of America. You do not leave Americans in harm's way, and after they fall, you do not ask what difference does it make why. We cannot have four more years apologizing to our enemies and abandoning our friends for the world to be safe, for America to be safe. America needs to be strong, and Donald Trump will lead on the world stage with American strength. We will rebuild our military. We will restore the arsenal of democracy. We will give our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines the resources and training they need to accomplish their mission. And we will hunt down and destroy ISIS at its source so it can no longer threaten our people or inspire violence in the homeland. You know, that's probably why more than 200 admirals and generals retired and more than 20 Medal of Honor winners have endorsed Donald Trump to be the next president of the United States. So it's about, it's about security at home and abroad, but it's also about safety for our families in our communities across this country. You know, our hearts are heavy this morning. As we all woke up to the news of two police officers in Des Moines, Iowa, who were literally ambushed and killed last night sitting in their cars. As my running mate said this morning, an attack on those who keep us safe is an attack on us all. Could we just have a brief moment of silence for these officers and their families? You know, it's been a very challenging time for those who serve in law enforcement in this country. My uncle was a cop in Chicago for a whole career. I, I grew up, every time we'd go up visiting my grandparents and see him, we, my three brothers and I would wait in the living room before he'd come out in uniform. Police officers have always been my heroes. And they still are. But it seems like it seems like lately, every time tragedy happens in the wake of a police officer performing their duties, there's too many in politics, too many in the media that are prepared to use a broad brush to demean all the men and women that wore the, wear the uniform on the thin blue line. You hear people talking about, about law enforcement as a, as a source of division in our communities. Hillary Clinton talks about institutional bias in the wake of a tragic event. Well, Don, Donald Trump and I know that the men and women who serve in law enforcement are not a force for division in our communities. They are a force for good. They are the best of us, and they deserve the support of the rest of us. There's a lot of police officers with us today. Would you all just mind showing them how much you appreciate what they and their families do each and every day? Now let me promise you, when, when he becomes the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the United States, a President Donald Trump will support our law enforcement community at every level with the resources and the training that they need to protect our families and go home safe to theirs, and we will restore law and order to every city and every community in this land.
You know, that's probably why more than 330,000 members of the Fraternal Order of Police have endorsed Donald Trump to be the next President of the United States. Yeah. So it's about security at home and abroad. It's about safety in our streets. But this election is also about our prosperity. I mean, despite all the happy talk on the other side of the aisle, right? People here in Arizona know what people in Indiana know. This, it's a very challenging time in the life of millions of American families. Here's some numbers. That, when I read these numbers, please think about faces and families. Don't think about statistics. Here's the economy we have today, the weakest economic recovery since the Great Depression. Nearly one in four Americans in their prime working years doesn't have a job. One in four. One in five American households has nobody under the same roof with a job. One in five. 45 million Americans on food stamps. 47 million Americans living below the poverty line. Hillary Clinton's plan? More of the same. Not the same. More of the same. More taxes, more regulation, more of the same failed policies that have increased the cost of American energy, and more Obamacare. It's true. Let me tell you. They tell us this economy is the best that we can do. But I think here in Arizona, you know better. With great leadership like Doug Ducey, the progress you've made, which in spite of what's coming out of Washington, D.C., you know it's not the best that we can do. It's just the best they can do. And when Donald Trump becomes president of the United States of America, we're going to put common sense, conservative principles into practice, and we're going to get this economy moving again and put America back to work. Because Donald Trump's got a plan. Donald Trump's got a plan. Working with newly reelected majorities in the United States House and the United States Senate, we're going to roll our sleeves up in the first 100 days. We're going to cut taxes across the board for working families, small businesses, and family farms. We're going to get rid of death taxes once and for all. And we're going to lower business taxes so that companies in Arizona can compete and keep jobs here in the United States and not see them shipped overseas. And because Donald Trump and I know that that avalanche of acronyms coming out of Washington, D.C. is killing American jobs. You all know what I'm talking about. You got your EPA, you got your OSHA, you got your ABCDEFG. So day one of a Trump-Pence administration, Donald Trump's going to sign a moratorium on new federal regulation, and we're going to repeal every single Obama executive order that's stifling jobs and growth in the American economy. And you know, I pulled the statistics this morning since NAFTA and since the China trade deals that the Clintons put into effect. Arizona's actually documented that you've lost 12,649 jobs. Department, your Department of Labor Trade Adjustment Assistance Program confirms that 27,000 27, jobs have been lost. The statistics are dramatic. It's remarkable. So I'm going to make you a promise. When Donald Trump becomes negotiator in chief, We're going to have trade deals that mean American jobs first. We're going to renegotiate NAFTA. We're going to get out of this TPP thing. And we're going to negotiate trade deals that hold our trading partners accountable to the citizens of the most powerful economy on Earth. And we're going to grow an American economy. And lastly, there's a whole bunch more in that. Go to the contract with the American voter. Look it all up. There's a lot more. But there's one thing I want to promise you, that in the first 100 days we reelect these Republican majorities, great congressmen and women, great leaders in the House and the Senate, in the first 100 days 
We're going to hold Washington, D.C. accountable for all the lies of Obamacare. All of us. You remember? You remember what Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama told us? They said, if you like your doctor, you can keep him. Not true. They said, if you like your health insurance, you can keep him. Not true. They said that uh, health insurance costs are going to go down. Not true. I mean, the Obama administration announced a week ago that across the country, the average premiums are going to go up 25%. But you here in Arizona, I mean, I, it caught, I, I caught my breath when I heard that the average premiums were going to go up 116% in the state of Arizona. You know, it's like just the other day our opponent's husband said, you know, costs are going up, coverage is going down, it's the craziest thing in the world. I guess, I guess even with the Clintons, sometimes truth happens. But let me tell you something. Don't, don't be deceived by Bill Clinton's newfound skepticism about Obamacare, okay? All right? For real. Hillary, Hillary, Clinton, Hillary Clinton earlier this year, she actually called, she said this, quote, before it was called Obamacare, it was called Hillary Care. And I'm old enough to remember that. She actually spoke to a group up in Canada. And I mentioned it a little bit earlier, you know, I mean, these speeches she's been giving. She spoke to a group up in Canada, and she actually said that she, that she wanted to have a health care system in America like the Canadian health care system. Well, folks, Canada's, Canada's, Canada's pretty far from Arizona, but I, I mean, they got socialized medicine in Canada. But my favorite quote in all of this it was very, very illuminating. My favorite quote came from President Obama himself. And about a week ago, he was down in Florida celebrating the third anniversary of the launch of Obamacare. Did you hear about this? Yeah. He said, uh, he actually compared Obamacare. <laughs> he, com <laughs> he compared Obamacare to the Samsung Galaxy 7 smartphones that spontaneously burst into flames. I'm serious. Here, here's what he said. Here's what he said, and I'm quoting. President, o President Obama said, when one of these smartphones has a few bugs, they don't, they don't pull it off the market. They upgrade it. They fix it. Unless it catches fire, then they pull it off the market. <laughs> here's what he said. Here's what he said. I'm quoting. President, o President Obama said, when one of these smartphones has a few bugs, they don't, they don't pull it off the market. They upgrade it, they fix it. Unless it catches fire, then they pull it off the market. Well, what a coincidence, Mr. President, because that's exactly what we're going to do with Obamacare. We're going to pull it off the market so it stops burning up our wallets. I'm telling you. When Donald Trump becomes President of the United States, we're not going to do what Hillary Clinton wants to do, is import health care from Canada, right? That socialized medicine. Here's, here's an idea. We're going to repeal Obamacare lock, stock, and barrel. And we're going to replace it with health care reform that gives consumers more choices to purchase health insurance across state lines, the way you buy life insurance, the way you buy car insurance, we're going to respect the doctor-patient relationship. We're going to harness the power of the free market to make health care affordable. That's the American way to meet the health care needs of our economy. So it's about security at home and abroad. It's about safety, and it's about our prosperity. But maybe, maybe of the greatest consequence of all, when I think about the implications of this election is the fact that uh, while the next president will be elected for a four-year term, the next president will probably set the course and direction of the Supreme Court of the United States for the next 40 years. And we've got to think about that. I mean, elect, elect Hillary Clinton, elect Hillary Clinton as president of the United States, you better, you better get used to more unelected judges using unaccountable power to take unconstitutional actions. Did you hear in that debate the other night? I was there up in Las Vegas, had a real good seat. I was like, me you. First question. Hey, man, good to see you. Uh, 
The first question was about the Supreme Court. She would ask a question. And she actually answered it by saying, go look it up. She answered it by saying that, that she wanted to appoint people to the court that would represent a particular point of view. Well, look, look, before I was governor of the state of Indiana, I was a member of Congress and served with the likes of the great Congressman Trent Franks here. I served in the representative branch of government. We have a representative branch that people represent states or represent districts. The president arguably represents all the people of the United States of America. What Hillary Clinton doesn't seem to understand is the Supreme Court is not a representative branch of the government. It's there to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America and resolve disputes that arise between the American people and our laws. So I would just say to all of you, I would say to all of you, for the sake of our for the sake of the Constitution, for the sake of the rule of law and limited government, for the sake of the sanctity of life and the unborn, for the sake of the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, for the sake of all the God-given liberties that are enshrined in our founding documents, we must decide here and now in the state of Arizona that the next president to make appointments to the Supreme Court of the United States will be President Donald Trump. It's that important. It's that important. So it's about security, it's about prosperity. And it's about the highest court in the land. But, you know, I, I think we just need to all recognize we've got six days to go, and this is, we've come to another time for choosing in America. And it's a dramatic choice. I, don't, I can't imagine in my lifetime that I have ever or will ever be a part of a more important election in the life of this nation. And so, men and women, I got, I got some assignments for you. I got, I got some work for you to do. We've got six days. Okay? So, three things. Number one, vote. <laughs> All right? And vote early, for heaven's sakes. Early voting is underway, and uh, I want you to bring a friend, bring a family member. <laughs> Friends don't let friends vote alone. Are you with me on that? Get it done. And I checked when I got off the plane. I got, I got off the plane last night. Mesa City Clerk's Office, 20 East Main Street, Mesa, Arizona. Open 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's only five miles from right here. So when we're done, go vote and bring a friend. Go get it done. Okay. And, and after you get done voting, we got some other work that needs to be done. That is, go tell somebody. Okay? I mean, I said at the beginning of this speech that it's, you know, it's been two on one out there with the national media doing half of Hillary Clinton's work for her every day. But the amazing thing is, is Donald Trump is still winning hearts and minds every day. There's tremendous momentum because the American people have decided to make America great again, and they're talking to their neighbors and friends, so you've got to go tell somebody. Over, the, over a backyard fence, worship at work. Let's pull somebody aside and say, I ran into Mike the other day, he told me to go vote, I did that, let me tell you how I vote. And let me tell you why. Tell them why. And for me, you know, and here's, here's the way I put it when people talk to me, I say, look, this isn't even an election so much between left and right or between Republican and Democrat. I think it's a, as Ronald Reagan said in 1964, this is a choice between up and down. And here's the way I see it. Whether we're going to continue to go down the hill to a weakened America on the world stage, a weaker American military, 
uh, abandoning our allies, emboldening our enemies, to an America that's more stifled by more taxes, more regulation, more Obamacare, and trade deals that ship jobs overseas, and walking farther away from our highest constitutional ideals, or whether we are going to stop, plant our feet, turn around, and march back up the hill to a stronger America at home and abroad, an America that is prosperous for this generation and the next, an America that stands without apology for our highest constitutional ideals. It's a choice between up and down. And that's what you've got to tell people. And lastly, so if you're taking notes, vote. Go tell somebody. And on that tell somebody thing, you know, I have to tell you, it's, it's so inspiring to campaign with Donald Trump. And I, let me, can I just say to you, I know I'm not the main event, so thank, thank you for coming out today. I, thank you very much. I'm very humbled that you're here. I'm very humbled. I'm very humbled that you're here, I truly am. But one of the things, when I'm, when I'm campaigning with Donald Trump, and he has tens of thousands of people, <laughs> wow. I'm in the car next to him. You know what he always says to me? He'll always poke me in the arm. He'll look at those crowds, and I'll have this look on his face. Where I, can, I can tell he's so moved. And he looks at me and he says, Mike, you know, this is not about me. It's not about us. He says, it's not even about our party. He says, this is a movement of the American people, and the American people have decided to make America great again. That's what he says. It's true. And we're so inspired. We're inspired by the fact this is a movement that's drawn independence. Drawn independence to support Donald Trump for president because they're tired of the gridlock in Washington, D.C., and a nation's capital that seems to be lost in that in that swamp of, of a different set of ethical standards than the rest of us live by. It's inspiring to see the number of Democrats around America that have come alongside Donald Trump because they're tired of liberal policies. Tired of liberal policies coming out of Washington, D.C. and tired of trade deals that are shipping jobs out of our countries. But I want to say specifically, as you go out, vote, and then you go tell somebody. If you're of a mind, if you're a fellow Republican, I'd like you to go out there and talk to some of our fellow Republicans. And I think it's time to say with one voice to our fellow Republicans across Arizona, it's time to come home. It's time to come home and elect Donald Trump as the next president of the United States. It's time to come home and re-elect Senator John McCain to a Republican majority in the United States Senate. It's time to come home and re-elect Congressman Trent Franks and strong conservatives to the House of Representatives. And it's time to come home to make sure that Hillary Clinton is never elected president of the United States of America. It's time to come home. So as you vote, as you talk to your friends, especially some of our Republicans that aren't quite there yet, and that number is shrinking by the day, I'd like you to do one more thing, and that is have faith. Okay? Have faith in the American people. I mean, go out there and talk to your neighbors and friends. Wherever you do that in Arizona, I mean... Out on, out on the ranch. Is it cool enough? <laughs> Go find him. Go talk to your neighbors and friends. But when you do, do it with confidence. Because I think you look through the long and storied history of this country, every single time the American people have been given a clear choice for a stronger America, a freer America, and an America that celebrates our highest constitutional ideals. The American people choose strength and freedom and prosperity and our constitutional liberties every single time. So have faith in the American people and go talk to your neighbors and friends. And lastly, 
Yeah. And lastly, have the other kind of faith, if you're ever mind. If you do what Mrs. Pence and I do on a regular basis, to bow the head and bend the knee, it'd be a good time to do it in the next six days. I mean, these are, these are very challenging times in the life of our nation. We have new and widening threats abroad, um, unknowable threats in the homeland, frustrations in an economy that's got a majority of Americans thinking that our kids aren't going to have the opportunities to prosper at the level that we have. We, we've got more division in this country than really any time. Anxiety over our borders, anxiety over the crisis of illegal immigration, and an inability of our nation's capital to solve these things. So I think this is a good time. It's a good time to pray. But when you do, I, I rather think Abraham Lincoln got it right in his time. He was asked whether he thought God was on his side. And Lincoln said, you know, I rather concern myself more with whether we're on God's side. And the God's on our side. So pray for our country. Just pray for America. Because America matters. We're the last best hope of Earth. We're a beacon of freedom. So pray for our country. And lastly, I, I would say pray with confidence. Because for all, the, for all the challenges of these days, they pale in comparison to trials and tempests through which America's passed through in our history. And from the first day that they stepped off the Mayflower on the Plymouth Rock, in challenging times of hardship, Americans have always claimed that truth that we could claim again today. That if his people, who are called by his name, will humble themselves and pray, they'll do like he's always done. Thank you. 